The other thing is um, my husband and I started this because it actually started with our professional page. And I used to have so many people coming into our office talking about relationships. And y'all, I don't even know how we got there. It could be like in the first 10 minutes to be an interview. An applicant comes in, it's an interview for a job. Spoke mostly men. 10 minutes after, he's telling me my baby mama did this. My mom, I was like, serious right now? And so I would end up talking to these people sometimes for hours. Listen, this is the message right here. Black boy, tell me how you really feel. Because I just want to build with you. Black girl, tell me how you really feel. I want to keep it real with you. I want to live better, eat better. I want to love better, sleep better. Yeah, I want to feel so aligned. Kevin Samuels. Isn't he lovely? What, what do you think? What do you hear? What do you feel when you hear the name? What do you think about... I call people's work their ministry. What do you think about Kevin Samuels' ministry? I think it's lovely. I think the fact that he's empowering men to be better, I like that fact. Um, I like the fact that he's really blunt with women because we do need work. Um, why the women listen, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm amazed that they do listen, but I'm glad they're hearing them. I mean, I'm glad that they're having the conversation. You say they do listen or they don't listen? I think they listen. They call in. That's the first step of listening, whether they're agreeing or not, because he's, he's, a, he's holding them accountable. You know, you have women that call in, they have three kids, and they think they need to have the six-figure man. That's not going to happen. And if he's telling them that, then what's wrong with that? I think that's a good thing. He has that brutal honesty from uncle that needs to be had because maybe dad is not there or whatever the situation. Now, I do think sometimes he makes them think things that are not correct. Like, you know, you got three kids. He got to make $350,000 a year. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I don't think that's true. But that's just, you know, that's a part of the show. I get it. But um, I think the fact that he's empowering me and the only problem that I have with him, if I had any, which I, I don't because I'm married, you know, but is that, and it's not his fault. He has a message that he's putting out there and everybody hear it, hears it, but it doesn't apply to everybody. And I think that's the problem that we have or that I have. Because you have average men or even broke men thinking <laughs> that they can tell a certain woman this, this and this. I'm like, oh, you need to be a six or seven or eight. He could be broke and he's still quoting Kevin Samuels. And I'm thinking, I don't think Kevin was talking about you. But OK, I hear you, you know, so that's the thing. And that's not his fault. You know, he has a, you know, a very big platform and everybody here it, hears it and men embrace it because sometimes men need someone to follow. And that's what they do. But it's just not for everybody. But he stresses that it's for high value. High value men are the ones that have options. But I think all men think that they have those types of options. And I don't think that's the, that's the case all the time. I think um, there's a bit of sarcasm with the lower earning men because the clip that made him go viral was the um, uh, dialogue clip the lady who called in it was like i make six figures now and i'm finding i can't respect men who don't make as much as i make so how do i get a six-figure man and he kind of ran her down the list of the things that men of that caliber value like she was a single mother she um she wasn't that attractive um, and things like that. So I think the broke guys are saying, you've been, we're on the same level, but because you make more than me, you think you're not. Because you think we value what you value. And now it's like, okay, since this woman who's a five thinks she deserves a 10 caliber man, since I'm a five caliber man, I'm going to tell her that I deserve a 10 caliber woman because you're not going to keep looking down on me. So, like, do you think that's the case that women who are actually looking down on the men they qualify for qualify? It's hard for me to qualify people that way, because if you have not met the uh, the qualification of being a man or a leader, none of that really matters, because I think you can, I guess, externally, externally be a five. But if you're not a leader, then you're still a zero because you still can't lead that woman. You still can't be the head of that house. So I think that's still the what's most important. But yeah, that part, that part I really don't get because, I mean, if you really get to it, you could see many men that may be a three 
and they have six figure women or whatever. They have whatever woman they want because they're leaders. And again, they're kicking in the door. They're doing what they're supposed to do because it's real sexy to be in power. Power is, <laughs> for me, I think power is more, uh, I'm not going to say it. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> it's Sunday. <laughs> power and access is more important than actual money because money can come and go. Now, some would say you can't have one without the other, but you can have it and then you can lose it and you still have it. You know, the lack of money doesn't take your power away. It's just that you can be in between blessings, building yourself up. I mean, there's been many people who have, uh, guess, you know, all these fake scamming people. I hate to use that, but there have been a lot of people who have who seem to be very powerful and have no money. But we have the perception of them being power is what we accepted but they really are not powerful if it's money driven, I should say. And uh, all these scams, you know, when I say scams, I'm talking about white collar scams. Some of those people were not, they didn't have any money, but everybody knew them. Their name was buzzing. And we thought, oh yeah, go talk to him. He has a lot of money. And a lot of people invested in it, but he didn't have any money or they didn't have money. So the power of it all was what everybody liked and invested in. So I would rather a person have power. Access is money. Money gives you access. Access is good, but I want the power and authority. And that's not something that necessarily comes with money. And I, and I think that's part of what I appreciate about Kevin Samuels. Like men know, you know, so I grew up, I played football in high school and I could come on the field and I could proclaim that I'm the fastest guy on this football team, mm -hmm. but I had to line up and prove it. Right. And I think what I appreciate about him, he's putting metrics on these things. If you think you're a high value man, do you make this amount of money? Do you have this type of network? Do you do you inspire this number of people, whatever the case may be? What are the metrics that women should use to evaluate themselves and not not as human beings, because we're all valuable, right? We're all we're all beautiful in God's eyes, but in the marketplace. Mm. How should women, from your point of view, evaluate themselves accurately, properly, whatever? Oh, that's a hard question. As I haven't been on the market in a very long time, but I think they need to evaluate themselves based on what they've accomplished, who they are, you know, whatever negativity they might they might might have. If it's a child or what have you, a first marriage, whatever, any kind of trauma, they either need to deal with it and they need to be whole. I think women should always come into relationships whole, as far as marriage relationships, and they just need to be honest with themselves about it. Because we're not going to look in the mirror and be like, oh, I'm a three. That's not going to happen. We're going to be tens. I mean, who looks in the mirror and be like, oh, I need some improvement. They're not, not many women going to do that. But if they do, they be, if they do, they should be honest with themselves. But as far as giving themselves numbers, I don't think any woman is going to do that. But I do think that they should be honest with themselves about what needs to be improved upon. If you fat, I got to exercise. If you're bigger than what you want to be, I need to exercise. I need to change my diet. And I do think women do do this, though. But if, if it's good enough, I don't know. But I don't think they should be, I don't think it should be catering to what they think a man should want. I think they should do it for themselves first. I don't think it should be for a man. Because, see, we, we have to have confidence to get the man also. A woman that lacks confidence is not getting a man, I don't think. And he's the ruler of his household. So why do we take away from him because he's not waking $250,000 a year? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with his power? It may not be, you know, he may not be moving the earth, but he's, he's taking his family from one place to another. And I think that needs to be recognized because everybody can't be the same. You know, everybody can't be six figures plus. So is this man powerless because he doesn't make it? No. So that's what I mean by that. Access comes with money, but power, that's a man. That's just, and I prefer that. That's just what I mean by that. But what my husband was speaking of is that, um, women should not have authority over men. And sometimes when I advise men, it may come off like, you know, just like what I just said a moment ago, I may give advice based on what I think a leader looks like or what I think a, a head of a household looks like. And if another man hasn't already told them or if another man didn't think to tell them that, a man somewhere may be offended that I'm telling them that. Or I'm saying, for example, I had somebody on my platform that was real out of control. And I said, what are you trying to do? And he told me, he's like, I, I'm just trying to deliver a message. I said, well, and to deliver, into delivering that message, are you trying to offend? Or are you trying to bring people to you? And he's, I don't know what his answer was, but they felt like that was me 
authority, being authority over that man. So I don't know. You know, I just I just give wisdom where I think it needs to be given. I have no, I have a covering. My husband's my covering. He's given me the permission to share my life and what our life and what I do on YouTube. And he's there. The camera doesn't go on unless he's there. So he's hearing everything I'm saying. So I don't know if everybody knows that, but that's the pushback that I get often. So so let, let, let's elaborate on that, because I think that's a fantastic point in, in the manosphere right now. <clears throat> One of the conversations that's being had is, number one, some people are saying the manosphere is a sacred space for men. It's, the, it's a digital barbershop. But we're seeing women enter the space and find a lot of success. And I think there are two reasons why. I think women find success because um, men crave female validation. Our entire life is about female validation. So we can procreate, get, you know, impress our friends with the attractive woman, whatever. But the other piece, too, is, you know, if you're an attractive woman, if you're saying things that are in line with these men, they feel heard, they feel validated, they feel seen. Right. The biggest critique is instead of just echoing the sentiments that men are saying amongst themselves, do we need more women talking to women? So how do you, how do you respond to that? We definitely need more women talking to women, but not necessarily do the women listening. <laughs> Again, it goes to you have to just create the platform and be the example. They're not. I, there are some. I'm not going to say they all don't. But first thing, there are not many women. Women are afraid to even come up to have these conversations because it is a man's space. And men are very harsh. I've heard, now listen, I don't know everybody in the manosphere. I don't even probably know anybody in the manosphere. But when I do, excuse me, have an opportunity to listen to people in the manosphere, sometimes it's very condescending. And they don't even want to hear what the women are saying. Right away, you're arguing. You're not listening. You know, that's the tone that they take. Instead of just having a conversation. Because for me, I'm here to learn from you. If, if I would be the one that, you know, I'm here to learn. But often it's not received that way. It's almost like we don't want you in our space. It's frustration. And if that's what it is, you're not going to get women to cam up because it's going to be very embarrassing to them. And they're going to fear that if they say the wrong thing, the men are going to jump all over them. And, you know, again, I'm wondering how Kevin gets so many <laughs> women to actually cam up and tell their stories because women um, and I'm going to say ladies, ladies are afraid. Women who may, may be in some form of delusion, they might do it. But ladies who are modest, who are meek, who are just trying to get information, get information and don't have all the answers, they're not. They're not going to come up. They're going to just kind of listen in from the background and get nips, bits and pieces from what they can understand. And they'll come to me. I have a lot. I have not a lot, still not a lot, but I have a few younger women that are coming and saying, I'm taking notes, security boss. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. Because they do want to be wives. They do want to be married. They do want that life. But... They're not talking loud. They're not. They're not kicking down any doors. They're sitting in the background like, nope, I'm not going to say it. Because they're a little bit, uh, a little anxious to say something. They will not come up. So I, I, I actually have an opposite critique. I think there should be more women who found success in these things in this space. Currently, the women in this space have not. They're not walking the talk. <laughs> so why do you think that is? And, and I, I want you to talk more about your platform and how, what, what, what made you convicted to even start doing this in the first place? Well, going back to the initial question, you're not going to find it because married, happy married couples are not on YouTube. They're out somewhere enjoying themselves. That's why, that's why you're not going to find it. But since I am here, I have men and women come in all the time. Security boss, 19 years, security boss, 25 years. So there are a lot of married folks out here that are happily married, but it's no representation of it because it's not on YouTube. It's not on social media, so you're not going to find it, but they're out there. The other thing is um, my husband and I started this because it actually started with our professional page. And I used to have so many people coming into our office talking about relationships. And y'all, I don't even know how we got there. It could be like in the first 10 minutes to be an interview. An applicant comes in, it's an interview for a job. Spoke mostly men. 10 minutes after he's telling me my baby mama did this, my mom, I was like, serious right now. And so I would end up talking to these people sometimes for hours. 
And my husband was like, you know what? We got to get this on video. This is just not real. So um, we did that, but it was a professional page and I had a lot of things going on on that page. And it was like, you can't do this. So we separated it in September. It got lost. It got lost. And in September of uh, last year, we started unsolicited. So that's, I've only been doing unsolicited a short period of time, although I've been doing this in my life. But unsolicited only started about six months ago. Seven, so that's, that's why. And it's because I want to help people. I advocate for men. I hate to see a man in despair. It doesn't make any sense. Because where are we going to go? What happens when you all are no longer? Or you, you have alternative lifestyles, you're in jail, or there are no more brown babies. What happens to us? That's like a lawless society. Nobody gets to come in my house and take anything from me. So we got to make sure that we're strong enough to go on into these next generations. But if nobody sees it like that and people are men divesting, men are going to other countries, whatever, or, you know, there are no more babies. Mm -mm. I don't like the way that sounds to me. You know, if we really think we had a problem before, we'll have a real problem. You know, the takeover is real easy if there's no men. Because there's not many of us that know how to shoot guns and protect ourselves when necessary. So I fight for that. I think, I mean, I don't know why anyone would think we don't need men, but we do. There's a book by um, a man named uh, Warren Farrell. I think he's a doctor in psychology. And it's called The Boy Crisis. And he talks about the fact that boys are underperforming currently, particularly black boys. And they are behind reading level, um, math, they're, they're way behind girls of their same age. And inevitably that leads them to prison, that leads them to depression, substance abuse, the whole nine, especially in our community. From a woman's perspective, from a mother's perspective, from an elder's perspective, from a um, business uh, uh, owner and, and successful business person's perspective, what is going on with boys? I don't think that's anything new. I think boys have always been that behind in school age, like, you know, elementary. I think that's always been the case. And it's mostly because they're not interested. Now, if we need to redo the schools or this, that's a hard thing because education, I believe in education. But do people have the money to make sure these kids get the right education? No, they don't. So that's just the divide of that's just how that's going to be now. I would just, to me, I'm one of those black and white people. I would send my child to military school way early. I would shelter that young man and make sure he got everything he needed as a child. I wouldn't let him out here in this big old world to think and have other, all those influences from public schools and things of that nature. I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow that. But that's not my situation. You know, so I'm just, that's just the circumstances that we're in. And if you can't get the parents to understand that that's what's going on, then we're going to have that. Now, does it lead to incarceration? Yes, it does. But again, I don't think that's anything new. We just have to get behind each other. And I don't know how we're going to do that. But we got to get the community. The nuclear family has to exist before we can do what you're talking about, what you mentioned. And we can't get the husbands, the men to marry these women, to marry the women. We can't get the nuclear family back. So that's what we're going to have. So that, that is something I even talked about a solution and everybody was like, that sounds pretty good, but you can't make anybody. I even said that if a man, a young boy, 16, 17, 18, has a child, impregnates a woman, he must marry her. Must. She must marry him. And then that, five, that first five years of that marriage of that child's life, we will take care of them. We would teach them how to be parents. We would make sure they have a job, whatever they needed. The village. Everybody. Well, even the federal government. Because you always incentivize in single family households why you can't incentivize a young person that made a mistake getting married and saying, OK, I'm going to make it right. First five years. And then after that first five years, that fifth year, you put them in a home. This is a married couple. Put them in a home. Teach them everything they needed to know about being married, about being parents, about having a career, everything. Even if you had to take care of them, what you call it, hand to foot, whatever, whatever we had to do to make sure that they were successful. Why not do that? Because if you don't want to be a part of it, then you won't participate in that whole program. <laughs> you know, maybe you'll think I'll be accountable for having sex. But if you did have the sex and you did impregnate the woman, OK, now you're going to marry her. And it's, it's, it's not an option. If you don't want to marry her, we don't take care of neither one of you. No more federal government. No more um, nothing. You know, 
No child care resources, nothing. You figure out a way because I've already told you how we're going to take care of you. But we can't just keep on creating single family homes or these young girls with these babies by themselves. It's not working. So why not try something different? And see, again, I don't think see anything wrong with being married. And I think it will lend to the thought of I'm not going to lay down with someone that I'm not willing to marry. So it changes the whole mindset. But right now, nobody's willing to change the mindset. It's always, no, everybody don't want to be mar married. Yeah, but you're still having sex. So it is, it is far easier to build strong children than repair broken men. I still try to repair broken men. Yeah. Why do you say it's harder? Uh, I, I think it's a Frederick Douglass quote, I, I believe. One, one of the, um, you know. Black. Uh, I think I'm envision a broken man that wants to change, though. And, and that, that, was, that was my question. How do you view um, rehabilitation? So for the, for the people who are 30s, 40s, 50s, they've screwed their lives up. Um, what, what, how do you approach, whether you're an advisor to them or you, they're just watching this video, what would you suggest people in that, women as well, um, do? Well, how, how do you start your path on a, I mean, your, your life on a better path? You first have to be accountable for whatever it is that you did wrong, those mistakes. Once you account for those mistakes, that mindset can stop right then. Because now you say, oh, now I honestly know what I did. Now I know I'm an adult now. I know what I did wrong. And you never have to do it again. Because the problem we have is we never account for what we do wrong. So we never crystal clear see what we did wrong. We still keep doing little bits and pieces of it, thinking that one day we're going to get it right, even though it was wrong. But when you can make a total account for what I did wrong, then you can change your mindset. And that's all it takes. I did a, I did a video on this where a woman, it's, this was a made up scenario. A woman had five kids, different baby daddies. And I think she can recover. Everybody was like, no, she can't. I'm like, yeah, she can. Because for the, she's taken herself off the market five times. Five times. So now once that child, that last one gets old enough that they can fend for themselves, she can at that time, once she's accounted for what she's done, go back out there and get the man that's for her. But she first owes those years to those kids because that's what she did. Now, if she can admit to that, because it's got to be wisdom in saying I'm five kids by myself. It's got to be some nights you're sitting there like, how did I get here? And all she got to do is say, you know what? I did it. It was me. Yeah, there were some men involved, but guess what? I didn't have to sleep with them. Guess what? They're here with me. Account for it, and she won't ever have to make that decision again, that mistake again. Oh, you know, they ain't gonna call it a mistake, but she never has to do that again. But, you know, I don't know. That takes a lot. That takes some growing up to do, right? But her mindset can change from that point on because she's like, no, I know how I got here. Unprotected sex. I'll never do that again. I am not even gonna have sex until I meet the man that I'm gonna marry, or whatever the situation may be. She can rectify it once she accounts for it. And I think a man can too. To close out, what, what is your overarching, like when you're old and people come to you for, for wisdom and for advice, what, what, if there's one sentence, one phrase that you can leave people with, like what, what is your principle on life, on love, on however you want to go with it? Mm. Everything is spiritual. That's what I say. Pay attention and just submit. I say this almost every day <laughs> in some way. I say it. Now, my husband always tells me, you never speak in sentences. You just think people get it. I say, well, that's what he gives me. So I have to give them what he gives me. But everything is spiritual. See, we walk around thinking everything is there's nothing by chance. Even you and I talking. This is designed for a reason, for somebody, for some day, whatever. And that's how I think. And I'm going to tell you something else crazy. I was sitting outside not too long ago, and I heard the trees talking. They really talk. So we give you something to look forward to. It's real. And if we can get that, then we will realize that um, we don't have as much control as we think. And if you just submit to life and what it brings you, it can be very good. But... We want to adapt so much to what's going on in the world. See, I acknowledge what the world has. I acknowledge because I'll be a fool not to. I acknowledge there's men and carrying guns and things of that nature. But I want to accept that for my life. There's something bigger for me. 
And I think when people realize that there's something bigger for them and we all have a purpose, then they'll be okay. But when we just walk around here, I'm doing it because they said, dude, this is what we're doing now. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. This is because we're doing it. So that's what I would leave somebody with. It's bigger than just what we think. It's bigger than this world. So that's how I would leave it.